So do you see the message, the title of the message today? As we want to start a short series on this wonderful chapter of the Bible, the New Testament. <clears throat> the me one of the last messages of Jesus to his apostles and the last night when he was with them. He gave them this wonderful text. I don't know if you are like me, but every time I read John chapter 15, I always have a, a big impact on me. It, it makes, it shakes me off every single time I read this text for two reasons. And probably you have some feelings similar to mine when you read John chapter 15. I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser, is the gardener. You are the branches if you abide in me. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will produce much fruit. But there are some branches that doesn't produce fruit. And when I read this text, it's like I wonder, have I been abiding enough? Am I really abiding? Have I, uh, am, I, am I in that? Or am I kind of slipping away from this? And at the same time, it creates in me, on a positive note, a desire, a renewed desire. This is what I want to be like. This is what I want to live like. This is, this is what my Christian life ought to be like. So it does both. In one way, there's a little negative feeling of not abiding enough, as I ought to, and a renewed desire to abide. So today I want to uh, just go do an intro on the first uh, line. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I want to speak more about the vine dresser, because it's important for us. What is a vine dresser? The vine dresser is working with, if you click this one, you will see just the, what's come next here. The role of the one who cultivates the land, who takes care of the vineyards. When, when Jesus says he is the husband man, or the vine dresser, or the gardener, he is in fact the one, if you look at the Greek words, is the one who worked the land. That is exactly what it means. So, my father is the one working the land, working to the orchard. And I am the vine itself, and you and I, we are the branches. The next, click the next one. The, we are going to look this morning about the relationship between the vine and the gardener, because this will become the, the foundation of what will come next, the coming message, the vine, the branches. You and the vine will have a lot to understand about the vine dresser and the vine. I'm thinking about this last year. I'm thinking about the year to come. That's a very good message to help us realize wh where we're coming from and what we are going uh, to do in the, in the coming year. My father is the vine dresser, the one who cultivates the vine. A vine must have a gardener. Uh, the, the vine dresser to plant, to watch over it, to see that everything goes well. The success, the productivity of the vineyard will depend upon the, the excellent work that the vine dresser is going uh, to do with his, with his vine. When he harvests, he will rejoice. He works patiently with expectation that this will be a great harvest. The vine is entirely, and that's a very important theme for us today and throughout this study, the vine is entirely dependent upon the vine dresser, upon the quality of, of his work, where it is to grow, for the fence, how it is protected, for the watering, the wa right watering, even to prevent freezing in some case for pruning. Last summer, uh, uh, two summer ago, Brigitte and I visited uh, a, a vine in, in Quebec. It's not a nice vine like these vines in, uh, of France or Italy or something, but it's a vine that we saw with our own eyes. Can you go to the next picture, please? This is a, a vine in Quebec. And uh, if, if you see uh, these uh, posts here, over here, I was wondering what, what, what does it do in the vines? It's actually very important because in Quebec, where I come from, it's very cold. And the, the, the kind of grapes that we have are like um, a mix to be a little bit tougher for the weather because the, the, the season before the harvest will be much shorter. And uh, the vines there has one international uh, prize 
for a kind of wine that Canada is famous for, the, the ice wine. So it's a special uh, grape that will be harvested after it is frozen. And then they will, they will bring it in and then they do a special uh, recipe with that and we visited this. But these, these posts here are quite uh, important and we found out what they do when the weather for certain type of, uh, of grapes, they, they have different seasons to, to get it. And uh, at some point maybe the, the ground and the weather will become too cold and it is dangerous that it can damage the, the harvest. So that they will build some fires and, and the vineyard, and these um, ventilators will move a warm air over. It's not a big, big deal. It's not a, a big, like, uh, hot things, but enough just to compensate for the cold weather and terminate the time of the grapes so that it will be done. So the vine dresser is, is responsible for that. If you don't Pay attention to these details. Maybe the, the cold weather will come too fast and the old harvest will be, will be lost. So it shows us the importance of a, of a good vine, vine dresser. Amen? Amen? It's just an illustration that we, we, we visited. We had the history of this uh, vineyard, the kind of grape they do. We went in the cave. It was great experience. <coughs> then Jesus says, my father is the gardener. So you have to pay attention to that. Who is the gardener, the special gardener that Jesus is talking about? Maybe you can go back to the previous, to the previous slide. Just see. Who is the gardener? My father. So it's a special relationship already. A relationship of trust. A relationship of, uh, this is an intimate relationship. My father is the gardener. So Jesus, the true vine, can have a complete trust in the gardener because he knows his ability and he knows that he is loving. So he has a complete trust, complete dependence in the relationship. So that is important that you know who is in charge here, who is responsible for the harvest, who is responsible to help you and to your life. Because there's a connection between the gardener, the vine, and the branches. So it comes, it comes to you. Jesus, and all he did, only saw the Father's will and glory. So it brings us to uh, the, the second point I want to talk about, and that's the main, actually, point. What kind of relationship does Jesus have with his Father? What kind of relationship has this vine with this vine dresser. Jesus is the one who reveals the divine relationship he has with the Father. Without Jesus, we wouldn't even know about anything about the relationship. Think about that. Everything you know about God the Father and God the Son is revealed through Jesus Christ. So if, if Jesus doesn't tell you, you will not know anything. And chapter 14 verse 9 says, Who has seen me has seen the Father. My father is the vine dresser. So we have two lessons here of absolute dependence and total confidence. Jesus is the one who is sent by God. If you look at the two slides further, you will see a series of, uh, of verses that will tell you what kind of relationship Jesus is talking about here. In John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. So here we see a few truths. The idea that the Son has been sent by the Father, first of all, connects him with his origin. I have come down from heaven. That's where he's starting from. That's the starting point. He comes from heaven. And he comes down to do the will of the Father. That is the mission the reason why he came down. Not to do my will, I came here for a mission. So in heaven, there were uh, discussions, there was an agreement, a plan was made, and Jesus accepted that role, and he came down from heaven for you. Jesus is the sent son. He has been sent to, to you and to me. So Jesus will seek the will and the glory of the one who sent him. If you look at the next verse, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The, work, the words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. 
So again, in this text here, you see a relationship. It starts with communion. It's out of that intimate communion, this agreement and submission. Jesus will only speak. Jesus will only ta teach what he will receive from the Father. And the Father lives in him. And he is going to work through him. Jesus is working in the flesh here, but he is working in submission to the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. That is a very important statement, because later on Jesus will take that statement and will apply it to you in a relationship with the vine. If you abide in me, and I abide in you. So that is to say the exact same thing. So that's important to go to the source this morning. John 7, 16. My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Uh, Eight twenty six. For I see only what I have heard from the one who sent me. And he is completely truthful. And the people who heard Jesus say that, says they didn't understand that he was talking about his father. John 14, 24. My words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. So all these scriptures and many more, there are just only a few of them. In the Gospel of John, you learn a lot about the relationship of the Father and the Son, his mission, and the relationship we have with God. But the verse that I want to bring your attention to and create a bit of a, a complication with it is coming from John chapter 5, verse 19. Truly, I tell you, all of you with certainty, the Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing, what the Father does, the Son does likewise. Many people look at this verse and they see a problem and comparing who is greater. Is Jesus really God? What does that mean? The Father is greater, is Jesus uh, less important? And it causes a, a problem because that's how our human mind uh, functions. Why since Jesus is God did he say that he cannot do anything of his own accord? Rather that he must be dependent upon his Father. So, look back to answer this question. Jesus answered this question in the Gospel of John. It is clear that the Father and the Son are equals. John 10.30, I and the Father are one. So that, that settles it. That's, that's Jesus. So it's like when you want to interpret or do theology or hermeneutics in the Bible, you cannot just pinch one verse and go out of, of, of your way with that. You, mu you must know what the Bible say, what Jesus is saying. He says, I and the Father are one. Here he says, I cannot do, the Son cannot do of his own accord. So let's, let's, let's talk about that because that's important for your faith and for mine and for the relationship we have with God. The Son has the full authority of the Father in whatever he does. But here he says that he cannot do certain things of his own accord. The verse that follow immediately the account. Remember in John chapter 5, there's a very good illustration that will help us to understand. In John chapter 5, we've been talking about it in the Wednesday night Bible study. It's a wonderful text. It's, very, uh, it's one of the uh, most outstanding texts of the miracle of Jesus. G it, says, it is in one of the festivals of the Jews. We don't know what it is. What, what it is. Jesus goes to Jerusalem. He walks to the pool of Bethesda, house of mercy. There are crowds of lame, paralyzed people, blind people who are crowded there by this pool because they believe that at some time, we don't know how often or whatever, an angel of the Lord come, shake the water. When the water starts to bubble or something, the first one and the water will get healed. So people are crowding themselves there for years and they are waiting and they are sitting there doing nothing. That must be an horrible place, a place of despair, a place of, you know, of, you know it's, it's not a good place to go. And Jesus goes there. And then he sees this man and says, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And immediately this man that had been lame for 38 years, how would you feel this morning? How do, would your body feel if for 38 years your body has been doing nothing? No exercise, no standing, no walking, uh, nothing, just like 
crawling on the floor for 38 years. That's a lot. Some of you are not even 38 years old here in this room. How many of you are under 38 years old? I'm not asking, you see? I've asked the, I, I have asked a good question. I did not ask who are more than 38. It's too embarrassing. I'm asking those who are less than 38. There's a big, big crowd here in this room are less than 38 years old. So imagine if you are 30 years old today and you have never walked. You have never done any exercise. You were born with a, a problem and you've been, you know, on the, on the, on the carpet for, the, for your life. Jesus walks by, says, stand up, take your mat and walk. And immediately, you don't know how it is. It's, it's very outstanding thing about that. There's no muscle. There's no strength. There's nothing. The nerves are the thing. There's never been. The blood is not circulating. And in an instant, he's jumping, he's taking his mat. It's like the, the story the Pastor Jennifer was talking about in Acts chapter 3. It's, it's the same wonder. What? How? How is it possible physically that these kind of things happen? So you, you see that. So the amazing in this story is that the people are angry. Instead of rejoicing that this man is healed, 38 years and his misery he is being healed today, people are angry because Jesus did this miracle on the day of Sabbath. He broke the law. He's a lawbreaker. Okay. So Jesus tells them, in verse 17 of chapter 5, My father has been working until now, and I too, I am working. When they hear this word, they are assuming that Jesus is blaspheming. They understand that Jesus is God. That Jesus is claiming to be God. And they get very, very angry. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father. Thereby, in making himself equal with God. So that's, that's all in, in chapter 5. There's, there's a lot of things in chapter 5. So Jesus replied to that misunderstanding and he explained very clearly and it is one of the most radical statements in the entire word of God because it indicates how Jesus operates. How Jesus functions, how his mind functions, how his ministry functions and that's a great secret for all of our success as Christians. This is the, the secret we need to learn from Jesus. The secret of his unique life. Total dependence. That's why Jesus says, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son does likewise. That is what Jesus answered in that context of John chapter 5 to these angry, these angry people. Does that, does that mean that it is impossible for Jesus to do physically certain things. That's not what it means. Because you and I, we can do a lot of things physically. You can choose to do bad things, good things, amazing things. There's a lot of, of things that you and I can do. So Jesus can do too. But when Jesus says the son can do nothing of his own accord, the can, can do, is not a physical but a moral impossibility. I'll give you an example of that. If I am in this room with my good friend Keith Moody, and Keith is a managing you know, company he's in, in, in the finance department, and I'm telling Keith at the end of the week, he says, uh, hey Keith, why don't you reimburse your expenses with an extra 500 Hong Kong dollars so we can take our wives to dinner. So he can do that. There's a lot of people who write a higher. I remember many times I go to somewhere, I ask for a receipt, he says, okay, how much? Did they want me to, to put the number that I want? I said, just, just what it costs. I don't need it anymore. So I'm asking Keith, okay, why don't you reimburse yourself more so that we can, you know, benefit from it and go to the restaurant together? And he would, Keith, I know, I know him, he's a man of integrity. He would look at me and says, I can't do that. Does that mean that he cannot do that? He can do that. He can cheat. He can lie. He can rob the company. So it's not that he cannot. It is that he won't. He will not do that because it would violate his integrity. It would contradict what he believes in. So he 
cannot do it. I can't do it. Not that he cannot physically do it, take the pen and write to, his, uh, to the financial reports. He can do it. He can cheat. But he will not do it for not violating a principle of his life. So that's what Jesus meant when he says, the son cannot do of his own accord. He could, but he won't. Because that's not the agreement that he has with the father, with the timing of the father. Imagine, if you go, if you look at the next, if you click the next verse. I don't speak of my own authority. The father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And the which manner, when, how. And I knew his commands leads to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. So he knows what's the will of the Father. He knows that the, the Father commands that will be leading to eternal life, to salvation. So that is what he wants to do. He wants to agree with the Father. And when and how that he will be talking about it. Go back to the pool of Bethesda. There's a crowd of invalid people. Jesus walked there on that day, and his eyes sees one of them. He did not heal everybody. He saw one of them. This man has no name. It's not somebody famous. It's not somebody important. He has no name. He is not mentioned uh, at all. His eyes fell on that man. And it says in the Bible, when Jesus saw him, he knew he'd been ill for 38 years. How did Jesus knew that? He wasn't there before. He's never had a conversation with this man. He never uh, knows his name. He, he, he has not been introduced to him. He doesn't know the history of that man. He doesn't know his family. He's passing. It is a festival. Jesus just ended up walking by this place. But it was the will of the Father, and it was the time of the Father, and it was what the Father had in mind when Jesus, I believe that when Jesus laid his eyes on that man, the, the, the spirit of his Father, the thought of his Father inside of him, because he's so connected, abiding, dwelling in him, my Father is in me, I am in my Father, that he knew this is the time. And this is, and also one more thing, it's very important in John chapter 5, don't, don't only see the miracle for the miracle. Because in that particular event that took place in John chapter 5 is actually a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. This is where the first confrontation with his opponent starts. From this miracle, the ministry of Jesus was at, under attack. And it, this is the first time. The, the whole pattern of his popularity changed from this, this event. In the Gospel of John, you will read that many of his miracles lead to confrontation of his opponents, persecutions, attacks. They want to kill him out of this one. So there's a time. This miracle is not only about the miracle, but it is about what it has produced after. Because Jesus actually made himself obedient unto death. This is where he's going. So this turning point when he healed this man, it's a good thing. It should have brought rejoicing. Instead, it brought persecution. It brought his enemy angry that they want to kill him. But that is the timing of God. So Jesus knows this game. So in his relationship with the Father, that's how Jesus functions. This is how Jesus operates. So the miracle of the pool of Bethesda is very, very timely. It's the time had come to reveal who he was. In verse 20, next click. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will be truly astonished. So this relationship, now we start to see the pattern and the relationship between the vineyard, the, the vine dresser and the vine. And you see a relationship here that is being developed and, and, and explained to us. We can understand that the relationship between the sender and the sent son in a very more positive manner. They both work together in accord for a purpose to bring salvation to the world. So the relationship between the sender and the sent son cannot be separated. 
You, you cannot break that relationship. He is inferior, he is greater, he is smaller, he is less or more. They are together in that. There is one more question or one more difficulty that it is important to touch this morning. It goes in the same direction. At one point in John chapter 14, Jesus says, you, If you really love me, you would be happy that I am going to the Father who is greater than I am. Again, in the same line, the Father, Jesus says, the Father is greater than I am. The reason Jesus said this word had to do with his humiliation, with the incarnation. We cannot say that God is, Jesus is not God. We cannot say that Jesus is inferior to, to the Father. Look at the next slide. We will understand even more. This is one of the most important texts for us in the New Testament. Though he was God, or being in the form of God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross or he died a criminal's death on a cross. So here, that answered very much our question about is Jesus uh, inferior, is the Father greater or something, because it says here that he existed in the form of God, his substance, his nature. He shares equality with God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, because he accepted a mission. So this is a state of glory in which he, he shared with the Father. In the beginning, before the foundation of the world, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is the nature of God. He is equal with God. But He did not, you know, cling to that when it came to you and me, to the mission that He had to perform. As the sent Son, He humbled Himself, He emptied uh, Himself. So the, the form of God is very important because it describes His pre-incarnate existence. And we must remember, remind ourselves that Jesus did not begin his existence in the manger in Bethlehem. You know, many of us who come from a Catholic background, we, we see Jesus, the little baby, helpless baby, in the hands of the mother, and we have been uh, instructed yeah, as in our Christian education, when you want to receive something from God, you ask Mary, that will ask Jesus, that will ask uh, God, and then you will receive it. That, that, that Mary, Mary becomes the, uh, the mediator. As one of the New Testament says, no, there's no Mary as a mediator. She's a good woman that has accomplished the will of God in her time. That has been explained to us last week in the message. But what we, we see here, we see something much more important. Jesus is the mediator. He accepted uh, this role. When it says being in the form of, of God, being described the nature, an essence that cannot be changed in any circumstance, it will remain the same. And during this humiliation, as God and equal with the Father, Jesus did not cling to the privilege of deity. He emptied himself, he humbled himself. You look at the, at the text here, he humbled himself, he emptied himself. So it is out of his own will that he did that. So it's not that he is inferior in any way. It cannot be. He emptied himself. That is also so important because this is also discussed in theology. He emptied himself. That means that he, he relinquished his divine, his deity, his divine nature. That he put it all aside to become only a man. Because we learn that Jesus is both God even when he was walking. So he did not relinquish that. But what we learn and the emptied himself is not that he, uh, he lost or he emptied himself of his divine attributes, of his equality with God. He himself in the sense that he took upon himself a lower form, the form of man. He did not empty himself of divine attributes, he emptied himself in taking a lower a lower form. Uh, this is important for us to understand that. This is the last evening of Jesus with his disciple, and he is telling to, to them in a way that that's my, my own version of how it, it, it is 
being said, my mission is soon to be completed. And me, the son of man, that was sent to be the savior of the world, I'm going to finish my mission. And I'm going back to the Father. You should be happy about that, because I am returning to the glory which I had with you, Father, before the world was. You find that text in John chapter 17, verse 5. So in fact, he's talking to his disciples, says, you should be happy that I am going to my Father because he is greater in the sense that, listen, if you compare, what is the greater state? The eternal glorious state that the Father is dwelling in in heaven, which Jesus shared with him in eternity past, or the state of his humiliation here, he lowered himself, lower than the angels, lower than men, a bond servant, a slave. He came to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest place. So which is the greatest place? What is the greatest state? The state of glory in heaven or the state of humiliation? So when he says you should rejoice, there's a context in that. This is the last night. I'm leaving you. I'm returning to my father. I'm achieving my missions. You should rejoice. If you love me, you should rejoice. I'm returning to my father that is the greater. Not greater in terms of being God or me. I'm not God. Greater in terms of state and glory, and I'm returning to that glory should rejoice with me. You understand? That's what we're talking about here. In the, I don't have it here, but if you continue to read this text here in Philippians chapter 2, it immediately says, God elevated him to the highest place of honor, gave him the name above all names, to which the, the, the name all knees will, will bow, all mouths will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. So there's an exaltation following his humiliation. There's an exaltation is returning to the, the glory of the Father. So, okay, let's close and coming back to John chapter 15 because we, we, we went around because we're talking about the relationship between the, the vine dresser or the gardener and the vine. So that we are, we are coming back to this wonderful text here. I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. This is what he will do. He cuts every branch. He's taking care of the land. He's making it productive. And the branch will be you. So you have better understand that. That doesn't produce fruit. He will prune the branches that do bear fruit. So he will produce even more. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What do you want your 2017 be like? The secret is here. What was missing in 2016? The answer is here. This is one of the core teaching of the Christian life. Last year, whatever went wrong, there's an answer that pops up out of this text. When you look at this text, does that text define you, describe you, say what you have been, the life that you have been? We're not talking about Trump. We're not talking about Mr. Duterte. We're not talking about Iraq or Syria. We're not talking, we're coming back to, to us. We're coming back to you, the branch. We're coming back to you, the Christian. We're coming back to you who live for God, who have accepted Jesus in your heart. We're looking, okay, what's that? We are going to start a, a week, the year, and prayer and fasting. Is that important? Yes, it is important. We are reading about it here. This is the time for you and I to make some, some decisions and to say, okay, this is, this is, describing me or this is not describing me or this is describing some of me and I wish it would describe me more okay and and I want to learn the secret of that relationship that made Jesus so unique what why Jesus did miracles and signs and wonders and accomplishes mission to the end. Why is this life so exemplary, so, so perfect and so, so distinct from anything? Because he, this relationship that he has with his father, the father is in me. I am in him. 
I'm always in accord with the Father. I'm, we are doing what we purpose together. So we are uh, talking about the same thing. If you don't stay joined to me, because there, there's, there's a possibility for those of you who are bearing fruits, it will cost you something. The Father will cut something out. Something that is preventing you from bearing more fruit. And me too. I'm including here. I, I read about this. And I'm thinking, that's why I'm saying this text has a deep effect every single time that I read it. It touched me every time. Because it's like, it's like a mirror. It's like a questioning. Am I there? No. Not enough. Should I be? Yes. I want it. Okay, so here there's a, the, the, the choice. If you don't stay joined to me, you will be like a branch that has been thrown out and has dried up. The goal, what the, the vine dresser is about, is looking for, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This is the true life. This is how we ought to live. So you see, and this story here, before Jesus talked to you, about being the branch, about bearing fruit, he tells you, lift your eyes above, look at the vine dresser first. Learn about him. Learn about the relationship that we have together and the, the weakness and what is lacking in Christianity is the answer is here. We live independently. We live like we can do everything on our own. We confess that we have faith we, we, we know all these things, but in fact, when we live our lives, we just do it our way. That's the problem. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. That's the true life that I'm looking. That's the kind of people I want to develop. This brings great glory to my Father. And the secret of that relationship, just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, so abide in my love. Abide in my love. Quickly, abiding. What are we talking about? Abiding. This is, this is the secret. This is the key. Abide. Abide means stay. Stay in a state or stay in a relationship. Continue and stand. Our union with Christ should be constant. Abide with me. We ought to be like that. Twelve times in this sh short text, the word abide will be mentioned, or united, or joined, or connected, abide. The communion that we ought to have with God is based on love. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. The believer, you and I, we are to live in that love. Believe in that love. And, and live in that love. Apart from me, you cannot do anything. Just like Jesus says, that's why this text is important, this entry is important. As Jesus says, I cannot do anything out of my own accord. Jesus is telling us, apart from me, you, the branches, you cannot do nothing. Our relationship to the vine, our productivity, our success in our Christian life is based on the same quality of relationship that Jesus Christ is showing us himself and his life with the, the, the Father and his relationship. The result of this dependent with Christ, you know, many times people think to be dependent upon God is a sign of weakness. It is like to, to depend of someone, we understand that it is a sign of weakness. No, I can do it on my own. I don't need God. I don't need you. This is my own mind. This is my way. Okay? So this is a sign of strength. Dependence is a sign of weakness. But in fact, Jesus is telling us something very different here. He's telling us that dependence on Christ is not paralyzing you of your energy. It becomes a source of power. You understand that's very important. Because just like in John chapter 5, when Jesus walked to the pool of Bethesda,
and his power was released and this man was healed and Jesus could do great miracles throughout his life and he's telling us and throughout all the texts we looked at I'm doing it in the time of God I'm doing it because I'm submitted to God I am surrendered I am obedient I walk with the Father, I do I, I, what I hear, I, what I see Him, and the timing of God. And He's telling us the same, same thing. So dependence on Christ is not to paralyze you and make you weak. It's to make you more powerful when you approach God. says, God, I don't have the resources. I don't know how to do it. I don't have what it takes to do your work. God says, okay, now you're ready to receive my power. Now I can work with you because you are approaching me with, with humility. Now I can work and fill you with my power. Another result of the union with Christ is that life, the life that we have. If you don't still join with me, you will be like a branch that has been thrown out and has dried up. So that's very important to abide. If you don't, you are like a branch that will dry out. You lose that life, that connection, that ability. So which moment of 2017 will define you? Or let's, let us ask the questions differently. Will, how will your life define you in 2017? I hope that like me this morning, it says, this is how I want to my life to be defined in 2017. I want to abide.